For Daphnis et Chloé, Sergei Diaghilev brought together Maurice Ravel as composer, Mikhail Fokin as choreographer, Leon Baxt as stage designer and painter, and Václav Nijinsky and Tamara Karsavina dancing the title roles of Daphnis and Chloé. The story was an adaptation of a pastoral tale from ancient Greece about the love between Daphnis and Chloé. She is abducted by pirates, but then she is rescued by the god Pan. Ravel created a voluptuously evocative tapestry on an enormous orchestral scale and with an additional wordless chorus creating a primal, otherworldly texture from time to time. He said his intention was to compose a vast musical fresco, less scrupulous as to archaism than faithful to the Greece of my dreams, which inclined readily enough to what French artists of the late 18th century imagined and depicted. Ravel's inspired music gained him international accolades. But despite this, and the creativity of Fokin and Baxt, and the dancing of Nijinsky and Karsavina, and also a very large corps de ballet on stage, at its 1912 premiere on June the 8th at the Châtelet Theatre in Paris, Daphne et Chloé did not have the kind of success with the public that it was later to enjoy. And in any case, its presence was overshadowed by the publicity that had fallen out from a great controversial scandal just ten days earlier. The first of two scandals that rocketed the Ballet Russe into the tabloid headlines. Václav Nijinsky had made a choreographic adaptation of Debussy's Prelude à l'après-midi d'Enfant, loosely inspired by the poem of Stéphane Mallarmé and he had taken the lead role himself as a young phone who, in his own scenario, encounters several nymphs on a hot summer's afternoon. And... Mallarmé's poem, and to some extent Debussy's music, sort of hint at the sexuality that lies behind this. But of course, what Nijinsky did was to make it absolutely clear <laughs> right at the end, where with the bit with the scarf, let's leave it at that, shall we? I mean, shall I put it? This was something that all the male members of the audience would have been familiar with, but not something that they would wish to discuss with female members of the audience. Do you know? Yes. And so that with a with a mixed audience, uh, that to be that, that to be put on stage was absolutely absolutely shocking. And I'm sure Diaghilev knew this was the case. He was into scandal in a big way. This was another way of raising money, of course, was to make things scandalous. Because the French love scandal, and always have done, still do. And anything that wasn't dull or boring uh, was, was all the better. And if you upset a few people, well, tough. 
but they were going to get over it eventually. Life moves on. Nijinsky fell suggestively on a veil. They called the police in Paris and because uh, it was considered so erotic. And so the headline in the Pittsburgh Gazette in the United States was Wicked Paris Shocked at Last. Shocked they really were. The editorial in France's daily newspaper Le Figaro reported, We have had a phone incontinent with vile movements of erotic bestiality and gestures of heavy shamelessness. But, in fact, there was more to it than just what the phone was doing. De Marie Rambert was there to see Nijinsky's treatment of the group of nymphs. You had to become, in a way, an abstraction of a human being, and he managed to make these seven girls, there were six girls, and for the chief nymph, he wanted to have somebody with a well-pronounced profile, and so they brought, I believe, from Moscow, Lydia Nilidova, who was very tall, and she was a remarkably stupid person. <laughs> and yet, under Nijinsky's choreography, he managed so much to work on her, to throw away anything that was ordinary and earthly and banal, that she looked like a goddess. L'après-midi d'un phone opened in the Châtelet Theatre on the 29th of May, 1912. On exactly the same date the following year, but in the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, there was an even bigger scandal, something totally without precedent in scale and impact in the entire history of music, dance and theatre. Le Sacre du Printemps, the Rite of Spring, with music by Igor Stravinsky, choreography by Václav Nijinsky, and sets and costumes by Nicolas Röhrich, caused such an astonishing amount of publicity that, as had been the case with Daphne et Chloe, but in a wholly different way, its shock effect completely overshadowed a remarkably original and strangely illusory ballet that Diaghilev had commissioned from Claude Debussy and Nijinsky. In any case, the public had on the whole been 
rather bewildered by Jeu at its premiere just two weeks before.